Good morning, Chancellor Baptist. Let's stand up and worship together.
morning, everyone. Everyone can sit down unless your name is... She's already sweating over there. Unless your name is Lily Meadows. Everyone else can stand on up, Lily. Happy birthday. tell you to sit down. I'm just kidding. You can, you can sit on down. Anyway. <laughs> we love you, Lily. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So welcome to everyone else too. I'm glad more than just Lily's here, but we love you, Lily. But welcome to everyone else also. So glad you're here. Just a few announcements. Um, you saw in Connect Group this week about our prayer list. It's going to be going out differently via email and all of that. So if we'll have, you'll be able to sign up for that through CBC links this week. And so that will be going out on Wednesday. But you can also sign up for it right out here, right outside of Pastor Larry's office where we sign up for everything. But it's our way, you know, right now in Connect Group, we're learning on prayer. And we're praying for one another. And so this is our way of being able to remain connected in prayer throughout the week better. Let's say we receive something throughout the week that we want you to be praying for. This way we can put it out for those who want to be involved in our church prayer list like this. And so again, through CBC links on Wednesday, you'll be able to register as well as signing up right out here. You'll be able to register for all of that. And we want to celebrate. Our ladies came back yesterday. We've got a trip. Woo! We want to celebrate they came back. Woo and so we're glad that y'all were able to go for, for just one night now. We're already getting petitions for more than one night. So one night worked so well. Why ruin it? with extended periods of time. So, but anyways, we're so glad. Thank you. We got uh, Tiffany over here. Is Roberta in here? She might be with the kiddos right now. And so, but thank you, Tiffany. And Leslie was in the first service. And so thank you for, for working through this. All the stress is gone now. Everybody's back home. Anyways, Miss Wanda has a couple of announcements. Can we steal your microphone, please? Good morning. Let's wake up. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. I like that better. Thank you. Uh, this week, or coming into this Easter season, is a really busy season for the church for a very good reason. Uh, this is when we celebrate why we're really here, because we have a hope that goes on eternally. And that is just so exciting. So that little bit said, that's just my own personal heart message this morning. And some of the things we do to celebrate... Um, are very serious and very somber. Um, some of the things we do to celebrate are also lots of fun. Um, one of those things is coming up this Saturday, and that is Easter Jam this Saturday. Yay! Mm -hmm. Easter Jam starts with an Easter egg hunt for kids' toddlers up through fifth grade, and we and they will be separated. Don't worry, your toddlers are not going to be tra trampled by your fifth graders. So, um, but. Toddlers for fifth through fifth grade for an Easter egg hunt. And then after that, we all come in the sanctuary and there will be some preschool activities and there will also be a, a cool program, games, crafts, uh, just all kinds of crazy fun for Easter Jam um, here in the sanctuary. And then we'll finish up with a hot dog lunch, which is a really cool to just finish, way to finish up and fellowship. Um, now, as you know, things that happen take preparation. Um, and so this Tuesday, um, not April the 28th, I think the slide may have said April 28th, but it is March 28th, not April 28th. This Tuesday, we are having a preparation day. And if you would like to help us in any way, um, get together the things that are needed for Saturday. We are filling eggs and we are making signs and making decorations and all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, and even if you can't do Tuesday, there should be some preparation happening because you should be inviting somebody to come to Easter Jam if they have kids. If they don't have kids, make sure you're inviting them to come to Easter at church. Come celebrate our risen Lord. So Tuesday at 12, Saturday at 10, and then all the Easter events coming the next week. Thank you, Miss Wanda. I would ask you about your really cool ring, but I guess that has to do with children's church. And so I'll ask Gavin later, maybe. I can always find my way home. It's a compass. 
Thank you, Ms. Wanda. Uh, just a couple more quick announcements. As she said, inviting our friends at each of the exits, we have these little uh, business cards with our Holy Week schedule for Palm Sunday, for Good Friday, for Easter, all three services on Easter. And so make sure to grab one of these on the way out to invite somebody with you to church. And then the week after Easter is our church-wide football event. And so we're going to be hanging out and grilling. I asked Todd to help on the grill. If anybody else, uh, fellas, I need a couple more fellas to help out on the grill. So if you want to help flip hamburgers, hot dogs, Larry's got his ladies bringing a couple. Some, JJ, you're going to be on the field, man. You can't be grilling burgers and playing soccer. You, can, you know, I'd be very impressed. But a couple more fellas, if you want to just uh, connect with me afterwards, I'll get y'all and Todd together. And then I think, all right, is Miss Wanda in the back? Yep. All right, kiddos, y'all can head on back with Miss Wanda. Remember, she's got her compass. Always find your way to Children's Church. You like, I felt like that was more a pity. <laughs> oh, Jeff. <laughs> Anyways, our last one, uh, just again, Rise Against Hunger coming up, keeping that on your calendar. I'll, for those of you who don't know what that is, we've got a little video coming out in a couple weeks about that where we get to come and pack a whole bunch of food that'll go all over this world. So it's a whole bunch of fun. So anyways, we're glad you're here. If you would stand up and say hello to someone around you. Let's get back to worshiping. My mic wasn't on. Woo, now it is. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way. to victory. 
God is so good. I always pray that, that the love of God will be enough. And that he'll continue to teach me to be more content. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up. So there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. I know what you 
Father, your love is enough for us. Amen. You can be seated. I wanted to begin with just bragging on, um, I got to visit with one of the Connect groups this week and, you know, over the last couple months I've been trying to highlight some of those really, uh, really great things that some of our Connect groups are doing. And so this past Monday I went with the Stratton Connect group over to one of the uh, motels tied in through Zoe Freedom Center and we got to deliver um, a meal. We, I got to, to watch. They're the ones who cooked and did everything. Uh, but we got to deliver a, a hot meal. And so it's something that this particular uh, motel does every Monday and so different agencies come in. But uh, it's one of those that they were the first group to do it. We've got another Connect group going out in a few weeks doing it. And um, so it's just one of those wonderful things that we got to, to tie in to the community to share the love of God in that way. And um, I don't know if y'all picked it up. Uh, we haven't really gotten to, to talk, debrief some of them, but one of the girls who was there volunteering with Zoe, um, she said, I used to live here. This where she, that was where she used to, to be as, a, I think, a teenager, a young girl. And so she grew up there, and now she was able to go back through Zoe Freedom Center and serve and give back. And so it's just one of those little ways where the group was able to get together cook a meal and, and serve it. And so I was just thankful to be able to watch that and, and that we as a family get to be involved in that in some form or fashion. And so we should be thankful that we all get to go out and serve in all these different ways. But anyways, you've probably heard a, a variation. There's a couple variations of this story, but one day a, a frog fell into a pail of milk and though he tried every conceivable way to jump out, he always failed. The sides were too high because he was floating in the milk. He couldn't get enough leverage to jump out. Although someone after the serve, first service said the frog should have drank all the milk and gotten out of there. But then that would just, what's the point of the story then? So he did the only thing he could. He paddled and paddled and he paddled some more until finally he churned it into butter from which he was able to launch himself to freedom. Wow, I don't know. Hey, there you go, Jeannie. 
But you see, this is where our faith is too often landed. We find ourselves stuck in the deep pale of life, not sure how to survive. The American dream teaches us to work hard, make something of yourself. If you work hard enough, you'll be okay and your destiny will just fall into place. Do good, be good, and feel good. We think that through positive morality, having good morals, through working hard, we can achieve our destiny. It's only through faith that we find righteousness or is it through what we do that brings about that righteousness in our lives? It's that intersection of culture and church. Paul himself was a good Jew, so he took the argument all the way back to Abraham. And during this day after, after Jesus and there, Paul was teaching in the church. And so there were a lot of arguments in the church of that day. We like to think we're special, that we're really good at arguments, but it's nothing new. Sorry, friends. And so there were a lot of arguments in that day as, as the Jews have been practicing for a long time. And the Gentiles, the people that are new to this whole faith concept, was circumcision still necessary? Where did baptism fall in church and salvation? What was the holy order among Jews and Gentiles? You see, those Gentiles, they haven't been following the same religious customs as the strict Jewish traditions and those individuals have. Why should they deserve the same amount of access to God in the church. These guys, they're just newbies. They haven't earned the right to have this kind of access to this, this gift of, of grace and salvation. So what's going on? But again, Paul, a very good practicing Jew, the one who had been raised and trained in all of this, had, had executed it and then executed Christians because of it. And so he himself had grown up and knew all of this, but he rooted it all the way back to Abraham. The Jewish tradition rooted much of their inheritance from God back to Father Abraham. Man, he's, we're not nailed it over here. So Paul reminded these Jewish readers that the promise and the inheritance was all from God and not from Abraham. For if it was from Abraham, it was he that should be boasting and prideful on Abraham himself. But it was all about God. It wasn't Abraham. He himself was just a recipient of the gift that the entire Jewish tradition then was based upon. It wasn't Abraham's hard work from which the promise and fulfillment came. For if it was Abraham's hard work, there wouldn't be anything to foundation our faith upon it was Abraham's faith in God which brought about this promise and its fulfillment so everything trickles all the way down to the faith in God which Abraham had not faith in Abraham not faith in one another not faith in the established church not faith in anything other than God so that's where Paul picks up. I'm going to have a quick word of prayer and we'll be in Romans 4.13. God, we thank you for all things. God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace that you are far bigger than we could ever even imagine. God, thank you for allowing us to come together to worship you for you are worthy of this and so much more. God, for the next few minutes, would you calm our minds and our spirits so that we can listen to you? And God, would you take my broken words and through your Holy Spirit, make them perfect for each ear to hear what it is you want us to learn about you and not my words at all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we pick up in Romans 4, 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, the Torah, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are the, or who are the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So we get this, this crisscross of morality versus faith. And so within the American church especially, we've had this idea of moralistic therapeutic deism. You might have heard me say that before. Moralistic therapeutic deism creep in. That idea I was mentioning earlier of do good, feel good. God really isn't that involved because good people go to heaven when they die anyways. And that's kind of where a lot of people land. But this promises are fulfilled by faith, not by good hard work. Now, don't get me wrong. I love good hard work. I don't want any of us to be lazy around here, but it is not that good hard work that brings about faith and righteousness. Just think about the two criminals on either side of Jesus as they were all three dying on the cross. Here Jesus was in the middle. He hadn't done anything wrong. 
except for taking on our sins, our burden, taking that upon himself. And you have each of the criminals on either side and the one started taunting Jesus, you claim to be the Messiah. Why don't you save us and save yourself? And the other one starts saying back to him, how dare you speak to him that way? This man has done nothing wrong. You and I, we're, we're paying the price for our mistakes. We were wrong. How dare you speak to this man that way? For he is perfect and we are not. And he, with very, barely any breath in his lungs, he looks over at Jesus and he says, remember me when you reach paradise today. And that's when Jesus responded back, you'll be with me in paradise this day. Now, as they were all three strapped to the cross, there was no way either of these tr criminals were able to get off and do good work. There was no way they could do anything. It was all they could do to breathe. They were literally on their last breath about to die. And so there the two were on the cross and the one was taunting Jesus and the other said, you are the Messiah. Remember me when you reach paradise today. It was by his faith. There were no works, there were no actions. It was his absolute faith that brought about this salvation as the man was hanging on the cross. Faith, not adherence to the law or Torah saved the criminal who cried out to Jesus. We like to have a good checklist of do's and don'ts, don't we? It's the clean way of living. I think it fits in our Western culture all too well. At its best, we live in a well-scripted life. Sometimes that script is passed down to us by parents, by grandparents. We study hard, we work hard, we treat others nicely, we go to church when it's convenient. That's living under the law of do's and don'ts. That's living to please others and self. That is not living a life full of faith as Abraham did and as Jesus expects of his followers. That's why I believe we see a much deeper faith life in underdeveloped countries. You and I, we live a very sheltered life, don't we? We come from different backgrounds. We have different speed bumps, different roadblocks, different barriers in life. But at the end of the day, you and I, in comparison to the rest of the world and the rest of Christianity around the world, we live a very cushy life, don't we? We don't have to enter this place for fear of our life. We don't have to wonder where our next meal is coming from. If you don't have any, go see Tracy. He'll take care of you before you leave the building. We don't have to worry about some of those things and therefore our faith is sometimes a little bit more shriveled because we rely on ourself and our good hard work and we follow the little script of life that has been handed to us. But that is not living by absolute faith. Faith is asking God at each and every moment in life, Father, how can I show you glory right now? Right now. Whatever that now is in your life, here, out there, at school, at work, at home, Father, how right now can I show you glory? Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. This, this faith stronger than any human promise, I, I promise you, <laughs> If I make you promises, I, I can't fulfill all of them. I promise you I will come up short. We all do if we try our very best. At times we all come up short. This faith on human promises will fail and it will crumble. This, this promise from God for the people of God, he had, he had given this promise to Abraham of this beautiful lineage, starting with his son, this beautiful lineage for the people of God. They had the promise of, of the, that beautiful land. We just went through Joshua in here. The people of hope for all eternity had rested upon if, if it had rested totally on Abraham and his self-will and his self-drive and his hard work, it would all be in vain because Abraham was just like us. He wasn't God and it would have all fallen. So it gets into this verse 17. These next few verses break down the idea of faith a little bit deeper. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So we find here the object of faith. Abraham's faith itself was not ideal due to its intrinsic value. It was strong, but it was the object of God where all the strength was. And if I can pursue a rabbit here for just a minute. Y'all know I'm really good at that, by the way. I at least called it this time. 
But even the proclaimed atheist or agnostic has faith in something which science cannot explain. For example, the idea of morality itself, we keep talking about morals, good morals, bad morals. Morality cannot be explained through science, yet even those who proclaim faith in God, will, who do not proclaim faith in God, will place themselves upon the faith of some form of morality. Even those who may possibly claim to be immoral or amoral still base that upon personal faith in the lack of societal truth or faith in a lack of morality. Everyone has this faith in something, even those who claim there is is no faith but we all have a faith in something let's be real we put our faith in our car this morning right that it was going to turn on it was a little chilly when I left I had faith the heater was going to crank up when I got in my car and then we were going to move that when I press that brake pedal that it's going to work we have faith in those things although I was talking with someone with a Tesla saying going down the mountain at Eagle Irish you didn't even have to press the brake pedal but my car is not that smart so Hopefully I am. But anyways, I have faith in my house that I'm going to get there. It's going to be nice and it's going to be safe that I can raise my family there in a nice environment. We have faith in our food, that we'll have food, that the food we eat is going to be safe. So many people around this world don't even know if the food or the water which they consume is going to be safe. We have faith. Don't watch the news too much, but we have faith in our financial system. That's why we use our debit credit cards for these things. Again, don't watch the news too much these days. We have faith in our medical system. If I'm sick, I'm going to the hospital. I promise you, I'm not just going to lock myself in the basement, but we have faith in that. I have faith in the emergency system. If I have a fire, if I need help, I'm calling 911. We all have faith in something. So the question is, where do you place your faith and how strong is the base in which you place your faith? Dr. Wilson was a good looking fellow. I've got his picture right up here. I love that mustache right there. I love that mustache. But Dr. Wilson was a great professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. And one of his students had been invited to preach in chapel 12 years after his graduation. Dr. Wilson came in and sat down near the front. Can you imagine that staring at you while you're speaking the whole time? I'm glad you're a lot nicer, Todd. At the end of the chapel service, he reached out his hand and spoke to his former student. If you come back again, he said, I will not come to hear you preach. I only come once. I'm glad that you are a big godder. And when my boys come back, I come to see if they are big godders or little godders. And then I know what their ministry will be. His former student asked him to explain a little bit further. He said, well, some men have a little God and they're always in trouble with him. He can't do any miracles. He can't take care of the inspiration and transmission of scripture to us. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God and all of them are little godders. Then he went on to say, there are those with a big God, the big God who, who can do miraculous things. The, the God who is able to, to, to do incredible measures beyond. He says, you are one of those and he will bless your ministry. And Dr. Wilson paused for a moment, smiled and said, God bless you. And he turned and walked out. The question for us is, are you a big godder or a little godder? Are you able to give God those big prayers, those big petitions, or do you keep them to yourself? You see, little godders give God little requests, keeping most for themselves to manage. Little godders are always having to figure out how to check the next checkbox. They're attempting to do most everything themselves. They profess to know God, but obviously their faith in him is weak. The little godder trusts himself more than God. God may make mistakes or make things more difficult or he might not do it in my time. So I'll run my life myself. I'll go to church. I'll check the check boxes so that I can do good and feel good. But somehow all of everything always seems a little bit off. The little godder has found themselves fully planted within the American church. They can do the things. They can look like a good Christian, but ultimately their faith is weak and frail. Big godders ask God to move spiritual mountains. Big godders are the humble yet spiritual giants of the day. The big godder isn't shaken when the doctor tells of the bad news or life takes an unexpected turn that totally messes up our personal life plans or goals. The big godder is willing to pray for the miracles, expectant of God to per fulfill those miracles, but content in the outcome regardless. Trust in God's plan to be fulfilled no matter what, even when it makes us uncomfortable the big godder is willing to sacrifice anything for the sake of the kingdom so who or what is the object of your faith 
Because when it is God himself, I promise you he is a big, big God. But we pick up in 18. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he had been a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. We find these obstacles of faith and obstacles are aplenty in our world, friends. Abraham had many reasons to doubt God. He was 100 and Sarah was 90. Now, I'm no scientist and I don't claim to be a very smart man. But what I do know is that 190, those good childbearing years, were probably in the rearview mirror. Can you only imagine Sarah's face when Abraham walked in and said, You know, God and I have been talking. Are you ready to have a child? Can you only imagine Sarah's response to that? We probably couldn't even repeat it in church. But our God does not submit to the laws of nature for he is the one who wrote them and he is the one with the eraser when needed. As Kent Hughes writes, some people are under the impression that when a person has faith, he inwardly agrees to ignore the facts. Abraham knew the facts, but he chose to have faith in the God who makes the impossible possible. The one who, as Paul wrote, who gives life to the dead and calls them into existence, the things that do not exist, this hope against hope, this godly hope against all humanly hope. For our humanly hope is no bigger than a simple box, a computer algorithm. Human hope is based upon the idea of circumstances and luck, but circumstances and luck, they both crumble quickly under the weight of this life. Charles Wesley penned in the 1700s a hymn, Faith, Mighty Faith, and it goes like this. I'm not gonna sing it, don't worry. I will recite it. Recite, that's a good one, isn't it? In hope against all human hope, self-desperate I believe, faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks at that alone, laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done. You see, you big godders out there, you know the one in whom your faith rests upon is the one who can do anything, the one who can say, it shall be done to your God-sized prayers. But the small godders in the room will allow the obstacles to get in the way and end at that laughs at impossibilities. Because I think there's a lot of people within the church, the capital C church, with their little God finds themselves laughing at the impossibilities. And so the prayer shrinks and the faith shrinks and it all just rests upon our shoulders at laughing at the impossibilities. But we know the truth that he is the one who can claim it shall be done. So what obstacles do you faith in your what obstacles do you face in your life of faith? Is it science? Yeah, there's some stuff that, that we don't understand. My brain is too small to understand these things. And so are we unwilling to have faith and we cling to these things? Is it worry? Oh friends, we're good at worry, aren't we? Control, fear. You know, I was reading an article this week about Um, many of the obstacles, Barna just put it out, it's a really good article, on many of the obstacles of faith for most people in American culture. And this list right here of these ideas that some of the first things we think of, science, worry control, those kinds of things as obstacles to the faith, guess what? They were way down the list. Do you want to know what the top of the list was, those 80, 85 percenters of people saying why it's an obstacle for them to have faith? Unfortunately, it's us. Those who claim to have the Christian faith yet live so unlike Christ. We think of this concept of Christianity. We go back to the book of Acts. Christians, that term first titled in Antioch of little Christs. Yet so many of us take on this title of Christian and we live so unlike Christ that that people are saying, if that's what living for Christ is like, I don't want it. If that's what being a person of faith is like, I don't want it. So unfortunately, as they survey people on their lack of faith, you and I are at the top of the list. Are we broken? Yes. Is God's grace bigger? Yes. But I pray that you and I can live in such a way that our, the way we live, our actions are not a barrier to anyone in this world. I would never want to live in such a way that no one wanted to pursue Jesus. I pray that we can live in such a way that people can see Jesus in and through our lives and they can say, I want to live like that. But with a little God, 
Our faith gets starved out by those obstacles. But with big godders, our faith is fueled by keeping the eye on the prize and the glory of the kingdom of God and his miraculous, incredible ways in which he works. We pick it up for the back end of this passage. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God and fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also, for yours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. All of this was for the glory of God and his faith was not counted just to him. But as we live a life of faith, it is to our righteousness for the glory of the kingdom also it took me to a story I recently read the man had gloated to those around him in the concentration camp where I worked he said I killed many Jews even Jews with children in their arms one of the men he was speaking to was Pastor Wormbrand and the soldier had just gotten back from the front lines of fighting with the Nazis and having heard the German name Wormbrand he didn't realize he was speaking to a Jewish man who had accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but assumed it was a Nazi sympathizer. Pastor Wormbrand, having listened to this for a while, did what very few of us would have ever be able to have done. He invited the man over to his home for dinner. The soldier loved music, so when the pastor offered to play the piano for the man, he quickly accepted the offer, and they set up a time and date. And when the soldier arrived, there were others, other uh, believers present in the room, but the pastor's wife was ill that day, so she slept in the other room as everyone hung out. And Pastor Wormbrand played the piano. They dined together. They had a long conversation. They were all enjoying each other's company. Now it was growing late, and the pastor turned to the soldier and said, Sir, I have something to tell you. You must promise me that you'll listen for 10 minutes quietly. And then after those 10 minutes, you can say whatever it is you would like. Now the soldier, he had really enjoyed the evening and was having fun. And so he smiled and he nodded. He said, yeah, I'll do that. So the pastor went on and said, in the other room, my wife is sleeping. She's Jewish and I'm Jewish too. Her family perished in the concentration camp where you bragged about murdering so many. Presumably you are the very murderer of my family. He said, let's go see her. She won't be angry. She won't speak negatively towards you. She'll only offer you cookies and to make you coffee. Now, if my wife who is only human can do this, he said, if she can love you like this, knowing what you have done and can forgive you, then how much more will Jesus forgive you for Jesus' love? The soldier then began to tear at his jacket and cried out, what have I done as the guilt of the blood that he had shed was upon him? He said, I am guilty of so much blood. And Pastor Wormbrand said, then let's kneel down and ask God for forgiveness. They knelt. Pastor Wormbrand began saying a short prayer and then the man who did not know how to pray started saying, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. I believe that you will forgive me now, he prayed. They both had tears and they hugged each other. The pastor looked and said, I promised you an experiment. Now let's go see my wife, Sabrina. She had heard nothing while the men spoke and they went and the pastor knocked on the door, woke her up, slid in, said, do you know this man? Sabrina said, of course not. So he introduced the two. This is the murderer of your sisters, your brothers, and your parents. But now he has repented and he is our brother in the Messiah, our brother in faith. What do you have to say to him? She simply got up, hugged his neck, and they both wept together. That is a big God moment. And friends, I pray that we can live in those big God moments. For the grace of our God, it is big. For the love of our God, it is big. For the prayers we should be offering, they are big. The faith of a mustard seed, Jesus said, can move mountains. What kind of prayers do you offer? What kind of life do you live? Is your God a little small, shrink away God and that you carry everything on your shoulders? Because I promise you, that's not the God I know in scripture. 
For our God is big and he is mighty and he can do miracles if we bow at his feet. And even when he chooses not to, our God is still love and our God is still good. And he is a God who is with you wherever you go. Friends, do you worship a big God or some little God? Because I don't know that one. But I pray that we all know this big, good God. Let me pray. God, we thank you for all things. God, teach us to have the faith of Abraham. God, teach us to, to trust fully and completely in you. God, for those times we get caught up in the good work, the hard work, trying to please ourselves and others, may we remember that everything we do is for you and that each and every moment we turn to you and say, oh God, what is it you expect of me right now? And may we have the courage to say yes each and every moment of the day. God, we love you and we thank you for you are bigger than any of us could ever imagine. And for any of my brothers and sisters in the room who are struggling with little God syndrome right now, God, would you reach down and reveal your majesty and your might and your bigness and your grandeur and your perfection and your love and your hope and your forgiveness and your grace that is greater than anything we could ever imagine. God, for every day you grant us another breath. May we worship you with everything we have. And may our faith grow deeper and wider, all for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I don't know how the Lord may be speaking to you today. If there's anything I can pray with you or pray for you about, I don't know what your God-sized petitions you need to bring before God. The altar is always open. But if there's anything I can pray with you or for you about, would you come on up? Let's stand and worship together.
couple of names for you to think of. We pray for Betty Dickinson as she's in, in hospice and for that family and for, for those affected by the, the tornadoes down south and, and those among us who maybe even it's unspoken prayer requests. We pray for one another this week. Friends, as you go out this week, how big is your God? For I don't know about you, but the one I find in scripture, the one I worship, he's pretty big, isn't he? He can handle all that's coming at you and so much more. Let's lay it at his, feet and have, at his feet and have absolute faith in him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.